<laughs> blue photographs, well, I see you wearing blue too. Virginia Holocaust Museum, it is September the 4th, 2003. I'm Barbara Berlin and I'm very pleased to be joined by world known author, journalist, photographer, and lecturer, Ruth Gruber. She is here as a special guest of the Virginia Holocaust Museum to chronicle for us her remarkable life and the many important historical events that she's witnessed. You have such a spectacular story. It's difficult to know where to begin. You've really devoted your life to rescuing your fellow Jews from oppression. When and where did this really begin for you? In 1944, President Roosevelt announced that we would take in 1,000 refugees. I was then working for Harold Ickes, the Secretary of the Interior. I had begun as his field representative for Alaska, and then he, he just began to give me all kinds of assignments, and I became his special assistant. And when I heard that we were at last opening our doors, I was so excited because I'd always felt so helpless. In Washington, we knew a little bit more about the Holocaust than the rest of the country. Not much more, but a little bit more. And I said, if only I could do something. And now at last, something was being done. And Roosevelt, when he announced that we were going to take in a thousand, did what he did very often. He dropped the whole thing in Icky's lap. So I went to my boss, I said, Mr. Secretary, these refugees are going to be terrified, traumatized. Somebody has to fly over and hold their hand. He said, you're right. He said, I'm going to send you. You're a young woman, you're Jewish, you speak German and Yiddish and some of the other languages, and it will mean as much to you, I'm sure, as it does to me. I said, Mr. Secretary, this is the most important assignment of my life. And then I called home in Brooklyn, and my mother became slightly hysterical. You're going to Europe now? And I said, Mom, I am, and it's top secret. I can't tell you why. And my father said, will you at least come home so we can give you a goodbye kiss? I said, no, they're shooting me with every disease <laughs> that is known to man, I think. But it's an important assignment. And then I flew over. They made me, my mother came first of all to try to prevent me from going. And she was so upset that I took her to meet Icky's. And my mother was completely underawed by power. And she said, how can you send my daughter now? Every day I read airplanes are falling out of the sky. How do I know she'll come home safe? Icky's got up, looked passed me, put her, he put his hand on her shoulder and said, don't worry, little mother. She's going to come home safe. We're making her a general. And they did. They made me a general because he explained, if the Nazis shoot you down as a civilian, they'll kill you. But as a general, they have to give you food and clothing and shelter and keep you alive. Well, then I reached the ship where the thousand were already aboard. And I got to know these thousand refugees because I took all their life history stories. And I have a theory, I have a theory that even though we are born Christians or Jews or Muslims, there's a moment in our lives when we become Christians or Jews or Muslims. And that moment came for me on that ship. It was the defining moment of my life. I knew from then on my life would not be in Alaska and the Arctic where it had been, but with rescue and survival. That's where you first realized then that, that you, this was going to be your work and exactly. that your work was not going to be done. Right. What was the eventual outcome for those 1,000? Well, they were, we crossed the Mediterranean and the Atlantic, one miracle after another, 30 Nazi planes flew over us. And when we got to New York, one of our rabbis asked if he could say a prayer. And I said, of course. So we made a space room in that crowded deck. And he said, now that we have reached the land of freedom, 
We must never believe the lies that the Nazis tell about us, that wherever we go, we bring evil. It's not true. Wherever we go, we bring the blessings of the Torah and we bring truth. And now that we are here, we must speak with one tongue and with one heart. And we must be filled not with hatred, but with love. And I brought them to a camp in a place called Oswego, New York. It's a town that lies between Syracuse and Rochester, right on Lake Ontario. And they had to live behind barbed wire because the government didn't know what to do with them. They had no status. They were guests of the president, but they were not prisoners of war. They had no visas, so they were kept in this camp and given passes to go into town for six hours at a time. But the schools opened their doors to our children. And the children brought America into the camp. The children brought the Bill of Rights in, and they taught the parents. And after 18 months, when the bureaucracies in Washington were fighting because each one, before they got aboard our ship, the Henry Gibbons, had signed a paper that they would go back as soon as the war was over. Now, we in the Department of Interior under ICU said, how can you send a thousand people back to countries that are no longer the countries they grew up in? The homes they had were confiscated. And we all fought for that new war and won. And President Truman, at Christmas Eve as a gift, got on the radio and announced that they would be allowed to stay. And of course, the joy uh, in that camp and the joy all over. And they have given back to America everything we gave them and more. One of them helped create the CAT scan and the MRI. His name is Alex Mondo. He's a great radiologist. He got a four-year scholarship at Harvard Medical School. Another one helped create the Minuteman missile, the, Pola the Polaris missile, turned his back on all these instruments of death, and our government sends him around to teach the usages of energy for peace. And all of them have become such wonderful citizens as doctors and uh, teachers and business people that it proves what this country has become famous for, that we're a land of immigrants who keep contributing to this melting pot pressure cooker that is America. At that time, had you begun writing about what you were witnessing and what yes, you were Yes, before I got this job with Ickes, I had written a book called I Went to the Soviet Arctic. I was 23, and I was with the Herald Tribune, but also on a fellowship to make a study of women. And they allowed me to enter the Arctic, and no reporter, even no Russian, had ever been allowed into the Arctic. It was the empire of Russia then. All their minerals, all their wealth was there. And I wrote this book about go going there, and Ickes read it. And he decided I should do a similar study about Alaska, and that's how I got to work for him. You mentioned some of the, the refugees before, but were they really like people who were without a home, without a country, yes. essentially? Yes. I learned what it means to be a DP, a displaced person, a refugee. It means you've lost your home, you've lost your language, you've lost your culture, and you have to begin a whole new life. And these refugees came from 18 countries Hitler had overrun. Mm. The largest group, though not the majority, came from Yugoslavia. And they were not all Jews. There were refugees traveling around and running who were of all religions, so that because this was a government project, it was ecumenical. About 880 were Jews, since they made up the largest number of refugees, just as they made up the largest number of Hitler's victims, six million Jews alone out of 11 million who were slaughtered. So that um, it was very interesting. We had Catholics, Protestants, Greek Orthodox, as well as Jews of all denominations. Then, of course, your work continued, and what had been an American pleasure boat 
took a ride that was certainly no pleasure ride. That's actually. right. That How did you get involved with what became uh, Exodus, Exodus 1947? When the war ended, uh, the New York Post asked me to come and be their foreign correspondent for a committee that had just been formed by President Truman and Ernest Bevan, the Foreign Secretary in England, called the Anglo-American Committee of Inquiry on Palestine. And they were to travel for four months. There were six Americans and six Brits, and they were going to try to solve the problem of the DPs, the displaced persons who had survived the Holocaust and whose dream was to get to the Holy Land. And the publisher and editor of the Post called me in Washington, asked me to go, and I said, I have to ask the boss. So first Icky said, no, I need you here. But when I told that to Thackeray, he sent Icky a letter saying, you're wrong, you owe it to the Jews to let her go. And Icky said, I was wrong, you must go, because you know refugees now as nobody does, and you know government, you and this, the government will be much involved in this committee. So that was the first committee, and they voted unanimously after we went to all the DP camps in the Arab world, and the six voted unanimously to let 100,000 Jews into Palestine, as it was called then, and Bevan, who promised he would do whatever the committee voted on if it was unanimous, said, in effect, over my dead body. And then terror begins terror, and after a while, he, Britain had a mandate, you know, to create a Jewish homeland in Palestine. He went to the UN and said, you take over, we can't do this anymore. And people saw at the UN would say, please, Mr. Bevan, you know everything, we take it back. But they didn't. They said, we'll create our own committee. And they created the United Nations Special Committee on Palestine. And now my former newspaper, the New York and Paris Herald Tribune said, come back and cover that for us. So I traveled everywhere with them. And I was in Jerusalem listening to wonderful speeches by Jewish leaders and Arab leaders when I learned that this ship called Exodus was attacked outside territorial waters, and the battle was still going on. And I cabled the Herald Tribune, and I said, I'm going to cover the exodus, and they cabled right back, do it. So I rushed to Haifa, and I waited in the dock. And Haifa, in 1947, two years after the end of the war, looked more warlike than Italy when I picked up those thousand refugees that I took to Oswego. It was red cap paratroopers, barbed wire all over, tanks and troops. You'd think an armada of enemy ships was coming in, and instead this battered ship came into harbor. It was the biggest hole I had ever seen, and you could see plumbing and broken uh, plumbing and children looking for mothers. There were a lot of orphan children, too, on that ship, and the mothers looking for children. It was one of the worst sights you can imagine. And here is this museum here in Richmond, dedicated now these to the exodus. And they have done what I have seen nowhere in the world. They have a big wall of the ship that must be about 25 <laughs> feet long. Yeah. And it is the ship three-dimensional, and I think it's, it's the greatest exhibit of the exodus I've seen anywhere in the world. And the people were coming down, and you can see it on this wall hanging. And there they were, some of them bandaged up. There had been a terrible battle. The British stormed the ship. First, they attacked it from both sides like a sandwich. And they had no defense, really, did no, they? No, no, they were told. There were some of the crew who had guns, but they were told by the leaders in Israel, in Jerusalem, it was still Palestine, don't use any guns, don't use any bullets, fight with whatever you had. So what did they have? Baked beans, cans, <laughs> and they fought with those. 
And one of the 16-year-old refugees was in a porthole watching all this, and he had an orange, and he threw it at a British Marine who shot him in the face and killed him. The, uh, the most beloved member of the crew and a good part of the crew were American young men who had been in the war. Bill Bernstein, who was a Navy officer during the war, was the second mate, and he was trying to protect the wheelhouse so that the British, who had stormed the ship and gotten in, would be in charge of where to maneuver the ship. So he stood there with a fire extinguisher and a British soldier or Marine hit him on the head and fractured his skull and he died. And it, it, it was so tragic because he was the one that everybody adored among all the Americans. And they killed another young man and 150 were wounded in that battle. There were three ships in the harbor waiting and I asked the commanding officer of the, all the British troops there, what are those three ships? And this commander, he was a short martinet who never walked, he danced. And whenever I had a question, I had a dance after him. And I said, what are those three ships out there? He said, they're hospital ships and we're gonna divide the 4,500 refugees who were on that ship into three ships. I said, can I get aboard one? I'd like to see it. Oh, no, he said, but we're going to give them food and beds, and it's a heck of a lot better than that tub they sailed in, but I can't let you on. I said, well, where are you taking them? He said, Cyprus. So I continued covering them coming off and taking pictures and sending a story back every couple of hours to Paris and New York and flew to Cyprus to wait for them, but they never came to Cyprus. Mm. And I got into Cyprus, they weren't allowing any journalists, and it was a British prison camp where all the Jews who had come on these so-called illegal ships, I hate using that word, trying to get into Palestine, were taken and put into tents and camps where they froze in winter and blistered in summer. It was a hellhole of desert sand and wind and they're going to have pictures hanging from my book called Exodus 1947 showing how they lived, and it was just unbelievable. And Germany, as horrible as the DP camps were, at least they had buildings and shelter. In Cyprus, they had none. 52,000 Jews in the years from the end of the war to the birth of Israel went through Cyprus. And after a week, the British announced they were sending them back to Port de Bouffe from which they'd sailed, a little port in southern France. France. So I flew there, and at first I was the only foreign correspondent. So they began sending messages to me so I could scoop all the papers. You know, they were going to have a hunger strike, so the Herald Tribune had a front page story. And after 18 days of insufferable heat, the British said we're sending them to Germany. And the world was so outraged. Refugee that, that refugees who had suffered so much were sent to Germany and the place got mobbed with foreign correspondents from all over. So the British consul called us together and said, I can't take you all aboard the ships. We'll take three correspondents, one to represent American press, one the British press, one the world press. And they selected me to represent the entire American press, and I think they've neglect they they've regretted it for fifty years. <laughs> well, was it the world's reaction really though when you started uh, having these stories published? Outraged, the world couldn't believe it, because so many believed that as soon as the war was over, you know, the gates of Auschwitz opened, and, and the refugees ran out, took a deep breath, and were free to live at last. That isn't what happened at all. When the war ended, those who could walk, walked home. But everybody was dead. And the ghosts of their relatives hovered over the streets. When they went to their own homes, neighbors were living in them who met them with shotguns and said, what, are you still alive? Why didn't they turn you into a bar of soap? Mm. Now this whole thing, basically led to the, the creation of the State of Israel. Right. Is that correct? That ship launched the state. It was 
there were many things that launched the state, especially the determination of the people. But the ship brought the whole world's attention to what the Jews were now suffering after the war was over. What were the stories like from the people who were on that ship? Sad? Oh, all the horror stories that I had first heard in 44, and some even worse because some of them had survived Auschwitz and the gas ovens. <coughs> so that was another defining moment of my life. Those two were major defining moments. But somehow, most of those people anyway had managed to persevere. So I would imagine you had some respect for them. Oh, yes. And by that time, two years had passed. When I first saw them at the end of the war, they were just skeletal figures. Now they were young, strong men. They were the, they, those who had married all wanted children, so a lot of the women were pregnant. The life juices had returned, and the men now were young, strong men. And when I got aboard the Runnymede Park, it was the British who helped first put them into those three prison ships. And when they selected me and I got up to the upper deck, these strong young men, half naked, just to the <laughs> pants, raised a flag, and they had painted the swastika on the British Union Jack. They were defying the British Empire. They were defying the whole world. And then I went down below, and there they, about 50 of them were in an iron cage on the lower deck of this former Lend-Lease ship that we had sent to Britain to help us survive, and now was turned into a prison ship. And they had two latrines, each with six holes for 1,500 people. And the refugees there said, oh, it's good here, there's air here, some air. And they <laughs> said, go below, go see our floating Auschwitz. So I went into the hold below, and it was a scene out of Dante's Inferno. It was very dark. And there they were, all of them, no bunks, no, not even hammocks. They were all lying on the floor or sitting up. You saw half-naked bodies. You saw heads here, feet here. And when they said, when they learned that a young woman from America who was Jewish and who spoke some of their languages had come, they began giving me slips of paper. Call my cousin in Chicago, call my uncle in Richmond, call my sister in New York, tell her I'm alive. And I took that, and then they said, take pictures, take pictures, show the world how we're being treated. And I began taking pictures. I don't know how I shot because I was blind. The only light came from prison bars, so it cast these strange shadows of light and darkness on their faces. And I was blind with their agony. And then a woman handed me her baby. There were a lot of babies. That's life juices were back. And I held that baby and I said, it's a beautiful baby. It really is beautiful. I have a picture of it in the book Exodus. And I said to her, what a beautiful child. I was cuddling it, you know, holding my cameras in the back. And she said, I know, but my life is over. I said, how old are you? 23. I said, don't talk that way. Your life isn't over. You'll get there. You can't do anything worse. I said, everything is stupid. Because this was so tragic, I had no words. But she was much wiser than I. And she said, I know, but I'm going to live. I'm going to live so my child will live. I'm going to live so that no child is ever torn from its arms, its mother's arms, or its father's arms again. I'm going to live. And they did. They were sent to Germany, and they were put in a couple of prison camps in northern Germany. And one by one, or group by group, they got out. Young people, children, they were put into ambulances. They told the guards they're sick. They take them into a hospital. They had all kinds of ways. And they got back to southern France, southern Italy, got on more ships. And most of them were in Palestine on May 14th, 1948, when it became Israel. And they were home. 
and some of them immediately joined the army or went into Israeli life. And I meet them, I still meet them, and Ike, the captain of the Exodus, is here now. Mm -hmm. What a great story. Those people were obviously forced to survive again yes. after surviving one time. You put it very well. It was surviving again, right. Mm -hmm. And did you yourself ever feel any um, personal danger? Oh, many times. You? <laughs> yeah. Many times. I would imagine. The Herald Tribune had me then go back right after I finished covering the Exodus story. The war was on, and Helen Reed, the uh, wonderful publisher of the Herald Tribune, who hired more young women than any other publisher in America, said, go back and cover the war now. And I went back, and there were all these truces. As soon as Israel got further and further along in the war with Arab states all around her that had invaded, they would call, the UN would call a truce. And during one of the truces, I was at a party in Jerusalem when somebody I had known from 46 and 47 said that he was leading a convoy to Tel Aviv. The only way you could get from Jerusalem and Tel Aviv was a big convoy led by an army officer. And I said, well, I'd like to get to Tel Aviv to do some stories there. So he said, fine, I'll take you in my Jeep. And the next morning we waited and a whole convoy assembled in buses and trucks and private cars. And our Jeep led the way to Latrun, which was a monastery of silent monks and also a British prison. And he said, we stop here, we wait for a UN guard to take us, this was no man's land, to the other side of Latrun, and then we go on to Tel Aviv. And he said, um, I have to see the Father Superior, one of he and a couple of young interns were the only ones allowed to speak. And he said, if you want to, you can get out of the Jeep and sit up there on the porch and wait for me. Women are not allowed inside the monastery. So I said, fine, and I sat on the porch, and suddenly, there was an Arab who c was crawling on fours with a gun that began to look as if it was like a cat. <laughs> and it got closer and close to me, and he was screaming at me so. And of course, I don't understand one single word of Arabic. And I thought, well, this is the last day of my life. And then Mamie de Shalit, this army major who was leading the convoy, heard all the screaming of, of an Arab, and he came out, and he was put under the same gun, and he kept waving it between us. And then one of the novices came out who could speak, and he began yelling at the Arab, did no good. And he said to us, uh, stay calm if you can, and I'll get the UN commanding officer. And he just flew across the field, and soon a jeep flew across back, and there was this gorgeous young British officer. And even in loud fears, I thought, I hope they don't shoot him, because Hollywood would love him. <laughs> he was so handsome. And he yelled, at, and he knew Arabic. And he yelled at this Arab who began to go back slowly. And then he said, both of you get in the bottom of my Jeep, because there may be an ambush waiting. And he took us and the whole convoy then through a no man's land, and we got safely to Tel Aviv. That was one of the times when I really thought that was going to be the last day. <laughs> mm -hmm. you, you're so well educated and so well traveled, so accomplished. Wasn't that unusual in your day, especially for a woman? I never thought it was unusual. No? I only thought I was doing what I wanted to do. I love words, and I felt that I had tools to fight injustice. I had words and I had images. I had two cameras and I had my typewriter. Then it was a little typewriter. Now, of course, it's a laptop. And with those tools, I have been able to go on hoping that I can help rescue not only Jews, but any people who are in danger because they need our help. And I feel every person in the world has tools they just have to find them. 
They can be on, in any level, any kind of tools. They can be wonderful mothers, wonderful fathers. They can be career people. But they must find the tool with which they can fight injustice. Those tools help you find your life purpose, it sounds yes, like. Yes, and I'm so lucky that I even found two wonderful men who became my husbands. One, one died. He was the father of my two children. And then another one who died. And now I'm alone. But life continues to be very exciting. What has been your real inspiration in your life for all that you've done? My real? Your inspiration. Is it some of the people that you've met? Is that what mm, keeps you going? Yes, and yes. Keeps you working? Yes, yes. Uh, I've been inspired by people like Eleanor Roosevelt, whom I took to one of the new development towns. She asked me to tell her to take her there and to let her see how Israel was absorbing all these refugees. So I took her to a development town and the night before I came and I said the widow of the great American president is going to come tomorrow and the next day with an interpreter who knew all the languages because this had Jews from everywhere and they must have been up all night because they were all there were no streets they were all out on the roads the women all had dishes with food that I had never seen in my life I'm sure she had also probably never seen and only Eleanor would do this. She went from one to the other and tasted everything and said, it's delicious. And then she asked the questions that she asked when she came up to us. We go and did the same with our refugee. Are you happy here? And, you know, talk to us. Only Eleanor would. And they were ululating. You know what that is when the tongue, you know. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> and they were singing out the words they'd learned in English. The Queen of America has come. And she was so moved. And I saw tears in her eyes. She was so really moved by this love. They didn't understand a word she was saying. And she didn't understand them until, of course, the interpreter interpreted some of it. But she could feel the love they felt for her. But when we got back in the car, she looked very sad. And I said, did something happen? And she said, I wish I had done more. Mm -hmm. And we all wish that. I put my hand on hers and I said, you did all you could. But it was government policy. And there was an evil man in the State Department called Breckenridge Long, who sent word to all our consuls all over, if Jews come in, even if they already have numbers, delay, 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 and they died. So Eleanor was a great inspiration, Golda Meir was an inspiration. A new play about her opened in New York on Off-Broadway called Golda's Balcony. And I've just written a story about how wonderful that play is by Bill Gibson, who wrote original Golda also in 1976 with 26 characters, which was a total disaster, and it was trash. And this one is a great success, and it's opening on Broadway October 3rd in the Helen Hayes Theater. So Golda was this, and Helen Rogers Reed was a very big inspiration. She gave me all these great assignments as a journalist. So you're still doing some writing, and I know you've, you've uh, written 16 books, I believe. Right. You want to hold up your, your latest one and tell us a little bit about what that story is? This one is called Inside of Time, My Journey from Alaska to Israel. And people always say, what does that mean, inside of time? Well, I learned in Alaska how to live inside of time because I might be sitting in Rome, in, in Nome, and waiting because I had sent a message. There were no telephones to other towns. I sent a message to Anchorage to please send me a bush pilot because I wanted to fly up to Point Barrow, the northernmost Eskimo village. And the answer would come back, see you Tuesday, weepers. That's W-E-A-P-E-R-S, which means weather permitting. Well, Tuesday came. The next Tuesday came, the next Tuesday, then messages would come, 
engine trouble, weather, because week was meant weather, weather terrible, or pilot indisposed, which usually meant the pilot was drunk. And instead of fighting time, as I always had done, you know, I was always rushing to get things done, I learned that I just had to relax and live inside of time. It became a kind of magic circle in which I could do anything I wanted because I was helpless anyway to leave. So I got to know the Eskimos better and interview more of them and learn about their serenity and their whole philosophy of life, which I admired. So I learned how to fix the typewriter myself technologically. I'm a complete illiterate. I learned how to fix the typewriter, how to fix my radio, <laughs> my cameras. So I learned to live inside of time, and it has helped me for the rest of my life. So I put that in this book, and this book really wrote itself because I had 350 notebooks, 2,000 Kodachrome slides of Alaska, and all of the story of Exodus is in it and the travel of the DP camps. And it goes from 1941 when the war broke out and I was there, and then I lived there with the soldiers and tried to help them find why they were in Alaska, because until the war began, they were very homesick. Once we were at war, then they were ready to go. And when they were homesick, I would play ping pong with them on Saturday night, and they always let me win. So I became the ping pong champ. <laughs> and we might be hearing more about this book still. And then Isn't pardon? that correct? We might be hearing more about this book right, in the right, future. Right. <laughs> You've been nominated for yeah, a, a Pulitzer, and I am very honored. And it's volume two. Volume one was called Ahead of Time. And now everybody, including the reviewers, they were waiting for volume three. And my publisher and editor, too. And I said, well, if I ever write it, because I end with Golda and with Eleanor and with Helen Reed. I said, if I do, I have the titles. My third, I might call In Spite of Time. <laughs> and fourth, Time Out. <laughs> time Out. I have one final question for you. And I've read that, that not just Jews, but people around the world, uh, many consider you a symbol of hope. Do you consider yourself to be a symbol of hope? I'm not a symbol. I'm an ordinary human being who loves people, who loves being a mother and a wife when I was married and had living husbands and, and marvelous grandchildren. And, and loves words and loves the fact that there are things we can do if we know how to use the tools that the good Lord has given us. Ruth, it's been such a pleasure to talk to you, and, and you are truly an, an inspiration to all of us. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. You're a wonderful interviewer. Thank you. Good? Good job. 30 mi 38 minutes. Oh, good. Is that what we you wanted? Had more than, we could have had more than one of my shows. That's only 30 <laughs> minutes. <laughs> How long do your shows run? 30? They're, they're 30 minutes, yeah, once a week. A lot of government people, but Jay's been on a few times. Yeah. Museum and